It's time to talk Gonzaga basketball. Get ready. Zag Insiders Jim Meehan and John Blanchett step away from the paper and up to the microphone to give you the biggest storylines. It's the Spokesman Review Zag's Insiders Podcast. Here we go. Good Monday morning. Welcome back to the Zag's Insiders Podcast. And welcome back to the full March Madness experience, complete with the upsets, the Cinderella stories, the improbable comebacks, superstars taking over like Drew Timmy, Andrew Nemhard for the Zags against Memphis, and the crowd noise and the environments that were missing last year during March Madness. Uh, the opening weekend of the NCAA tournament, those four days are arguably the best four on the sport, on sports calendar. I might throw the Masters in there myself as a, as a worthy competitor, but uh, probably more alone in that than uh, most of the country. Uh, Gonzaga coach Mark Few calls it uh, the tournament itself, the best sporting event on the planet. And after that Gonzaga Memphis game and uh, geez, with what we saw with Arizona, TCU with, with Duke, Michigan State, all those other games. I tweeted out Saturday night, there's growing evidence to support that claim. Uh, where does this uh, event fall on the sports calendar for our guys here? Let's get the starting lineup. John Blanchett, retired uh, columnist for the Spokesman Review. Uh, Richard Fox, sports uh, or t- television analyst for Gonzaga's uh, games on uh, regional local broadcast, SWX, KHQ, Root Sports. What do you think, uh, John? Well, where's the uh, March Madness rate on your uh, TV watching schedules? Well, you know, it's interesting. This is the first year I've really had a chance to watch it. It's, you know, I've, I've been at an event. I've been at usually following Gonzaga um, in some years, Washington State in the mid-2000s. Uh, but And so I didn't really get to enjoy maybe, it, although you're there, and that's a different kind of enjoyment for sure. Um, but I watched more basketball in these last four days. Uh, my wife might be filing papers on me as we speak because I was pretty glued to the TV and dominating it. Uh, and just no question to me that, that it is my favorite four days in sports. Um, you know, I've got a lot of favorite sports. I, you know, I, I love baseball. I've always loved track and field. Um, you know, I'll, I'll watch every Super Bowl. But, but these, uh, these four days uh, are just sensational. It's almost round-the-clock basketball. Um, the games just seem to get better and better. Uh, there are very few blowouts. Um, the parody is greater than ever. And some of the finishes that we saw, wow. I mean, like you say, going up to 10 o'clock last night, uh, watching Arizona try and uh, finally put down TCU in overtime. Um, it's incredible. And I, I couldn't have enjoyed myself more these last four days. <laughs> it was something to watch. Always is. Hey, bad part is having to work it. You don't get to see all the games <laughs> as much as you'd like. Yeah. Uh, Let's, uh, let's recap that opening weekend for Gonzaga. Uh, number one seed versus 16 seed Georgia State. Uh, they did not look like a 16 seed uh, in person or on paper, really. Uh, they were a feisty outfit, tough-minded, and, and gave the Zags fits for 30 minutes. Uh, Richard, why, uh, why was that game uh, so close for so long, and, and what did it take for Gonzaga to get some separation? Well, I would agree. Um, they certainly didn't look the part of a 16 seed, but the reality is of the last few years, I think what a 16 seed looks like has changed versus what it may have looked like, you know, 10, 15 years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, just the, you know, parodies, the people use the word parody all the time now in college athletics or college basketball, I should say, uh, probably too much. But when you get to the tournament, you can just see that the difference between the top end and the bottom end, at least based on the seedings, is not uh, dramatic. You know, it, it's it's rare when you've got a team that is completely um, head and shoulders above everybody else. You know, you can lose any night. And, you know, I thought Gonzaga came out a bit tentative, just nervous, which is to be expected. You know, when you're the, when you're the low seed, and that's what I was throughout my career in the, in the tournament, you don't have a lot of nerves and that you don't, you're, you're not expected to win. <laughs> you know, you just, you're playing for each other and your group and, and you're trying to, 
uh, put together a good, a good game. But when you're the top seed, and I think it's even more pronounced these days where you've got the games in Portland if you're uh, Gonzaga, you've got the games in San Diego if you're Arizona, where it's effectively a home game. And we've been in those gyms where if you could get off to a, it doesn't take a whole long, a long time. If you get off to a slow start, you start hearing some groans and uh, some consternation in the fan base. And that adds a little bit more pressure. And um, I thought they just looked a little nervous. You know, they didn't uh, play particularly well in the first half. I mean, the free throws, I know we'll dive into that. Uh, I'm sure in, in, uh, in more detail, but, you know, two of 11 in the first half from three, um, you know, Timmy getting off to a slow start. But once they got their legs under them, and I think just kind of found a rhythm, you saw what the difference was between both both teams. And um, I'm usually more nervous for those games than I was going into the Memphis game. <laughs> um, but at the end of the day, they, they handled their business. And um, as we can, as we saw with St. Peter's in Kentucky, uh, even though that's a two and a 15, um, it, it's still difficult to win in this tournament. I don't care what number you have in front of your name. All these games are hard. Yeah, that one was was hard, very hard for 30 minutes. They, they I think it was a four point game, even though the Panthers lost, uh, you know, their best big man. Uh, he, he went down with an injury in the first half. And then they were in deep foul trouble with their other bigs, thanks to Holmgren and Timmy. Um, but they, they, they kept playing. They had a nice guard line. Uh, I, I don't think there's any doubt Georgia State got some respect. Uh, I think the Zags respected them coming in. I mean, Mark talked about them being under underseated. But uh, the way they played, the way they brought it with, without uh, much fear, uh, I think they probably earned a lot of fans, John, uh, after that effort. Oh yeah, there's no question about it, and 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 that's where things you know obviously turn is when they they lost uh, the one kid to injury, and and then their big started to get get foul trouble. That's going to happen when you're trying to guard Drew Timmy and, and Chet Holmgren. Uh, you, you know that that's that's eventually probably going to take place for if you're a team um, of of Georgia State's caliber. And I guess the difference you know these days is when we talk about parity is what's behind those, those starters to, to do battle against the better players of the, of the top, you know, the top seeds, ones, the twos, the threes. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the, the scrap in those, in those teams, and we saw it in St. Peter's, we've, we've seen it in, in any number of these, the, the, the lower seeded teams um, is going to come to a different level. This is their, their, they're playing for their lives. And uh, in that, well, everybody is, but, like Richard says, there's a looseness and there's a nothing to lose uh, mentality about it that that just allows them to be a, a little friskier, I think, than than some of the the uh, the favorites in the upper seeds. Um, you know, I think a lot of Gonzaga's problem, uh, the tentativeness, uh, you could you could see in their offensive effort. Uh, I, I know over the year they shoot about what 35 percent of their shots or threes. This one was closer to 40 percent in the first half. Um, and by game's end, it was back down in the 20s. So, you know, obviously Gonzaga knew what it had to do uh, to get separation. Um, and some of that was just play a little harder, play a little smarter, pound it into inside where their advantage was. Yeah, it's, it, and I just, to, yeah, to piggyback on that, I mean, yeah, 17% of their shots versus 37% of the shots in the second half came inside. Yeah. Um, it was, <laughs> I, don't, I don't think we need to be all that fluent in the game to know what the adjustment was at halftime. Uh, but, I, you know, the, the St. Peter's, Georgia State, it just shows you the power of good guard play. And yeah. the Panthers had, a, you know, a, a threesome in the backcourt that can play against anybody. And I think that created a lot of problems for GU. But um, you're absolutely right, John. Once they, I think, relied a little less on that three-point shot and got the ball inside, that was the difference. I kind of had the feel of a, a game me and John covered, the, the Southern game back in Salt Lake City uh, turned into a, a real dogfight for 40 minutes, and Southern stayed in it long enough to have the crowd turn in their favor and made it uh, exponentially harder for the Zags to finish that game. Uh, Georgia State didn't get it to that point. The Zags pulled away with about 10, 11 minutes left and, and uh, took care of business by 21 uh, let's move on to Memphis. And uh, I watched Memphis play Boise State. 
uh, before the Zags game against Georgia State. And man, that first half was a clinic. And they were uh, athleticism, mind boggling athleticism. I mean, pressure, take you out of your offense, force bad shots, uh, get after you on the glass. Um, they and they hit shots. Uh, so they took Boise. Uh, they, I think they had a 19 point lead at halftime. And I saw Adam Morrison, uh, GU's radio man, uh, you know, in between the half. And I said, how did these guys lose 10 games? <laughs> I mean, they looked that good. And then the second half, they kind of showed how they could lose 10 games. The, the wheels came off offensively. Boise clearly the aggressor and, and got back in that game and, and pushed them to the finish line before Memphis won. I think everybody knew the Zags challenge coming into uh, the, the game on Saturday was going to be uh, trying to keep them off the glass was how you're going to score uh, against the, uh, the length and the athleticism, how you're going to handle the pressure, which uh, Andrew Nemhard uh, was extraordinary for 40 minutes in that game. And, and Drew Timmy, after uh, a little halftime scolding of himself and teammates and Mark Few getting in all their ears, uh, did what he did against Georgia State, against a, a much better uh, opponent, and took that game over for a while and got the Zags back in it. Uh, halftime of that game, the Zags are down 10. I will freely admit I, I was not too high on the confidence level coming back from that deficit, especially after watching it, how, how they got down 10. Richard, give me your uh, give me your confidence level at halftime and, and what you saw to, to turn it around in the second half. I mean, a hundred, obviously, a hundred percent. I mean, I knew Drew Drew was going to go off in the second half. <laughs> <Not a, laughs> uh, I mean, you're certainly. I was certainly concerned, but I, I will. To be perfectly honest, there was something about that first half that I thought they'd be okay. Um, you, but you, you you weren't running away from Memphis. But, you know, I watched it again last night because I'm a degenerate. And, you know, I was really wanting to watch Timmy. And I, I thought he played well in the first half. They just couldn't get him the ball. Every time he touched the ball, he either got fouled or he scored. Um, but the, to your point, Jim, the pressure from Memphis and their length, you know, on so many catches, other than Nemhard and Bolton, when I looked at Strother, when I looked at Holmgren, yeah. On their catches on the perimeter, they're backs to the basket. You know, they're trying to protect the ball. And so as a result, you know, there was a handful of possessions where you either, you know, either Drew had good position or he had a guy on his back and they just never gave him the ball. Um, and he wasn't as forceful as he clearly was in the second half at demanding the ball. And I thought in the second half, as, you know, I'm sure we'll talk about kind of the adjustments. He started catching the ball just further away from the rim making it easier on those guys to deliver it. And then he just went to work. Um, but to your point about Memphis's second halves, I mean, you know, you saw that against Boise and, you know, it felt like they may come a bit back down to earth in the second half, as far as shooting the ball. And, you know, we saw that one of seven from three um, and just, they, they, they couldn't find the same rhythm, but um you know, they said it's on the broadcast, Jim, and, and you may have missed it, but I totally agree with it, and I'm sure John did too. Memphis is different. That speed and athleticism, you could, I mean, they, you're hard, you'll be hard pressed to find another program that has that at that level across their roster, and it can take a while to get used to what you're what you're seeing as a player. Um, and I think it took you know to you about 20 25 minutes to finally get comfortable with that pace and not play rush but actually just play fast but under control and the depth i, I was very yeah. impressed with what they brought in the backup bigs second and third backup bigs uh, were very good and uh, they bring in amani bates off the off the bench because he's kind of battling a back injury uh, he's the top five recruit in the country and uh, kind of a smaller Chet Holmgren. He's about 6'9 and about 185, really long and, and thin, but very effective, uh, still working his way back. You, I think when he's healthy, you can see he can be an important player for him. But uh, what, a, what a second half the Zags had with, the, with Memphis to uh, kind of – there was one point there where they, they, they uh, kind of caught up. Memphis pulled ahead 55-51. 
I thought two of the bigger baskets that kind of went, you know, into the background with what happened later were Rasir Bolton's two buckets in a row to tie that game. And as much as Drew did to, to get him ahead, I think it's 68, 66 with an assist to Holmgren. It was those guards down the stretch, uh, Nemhard in particular and, and Rasir Bolton that, that uh, lifted him to the finish line. Uh, John, your takeaways from uh, just an instant classic to watch on television and in person. Yeah, you guys uh, you touched on them pretty much all. I just, you know, as, as good as Drew was, a couple of those shots that he made were, were kind of ridiculous. I remember one turnaround shot uh, from about 12, 14 feet away, that a little farther out of his comfort zone. And I know Richard, Richard made a great point about coming out a little farther to get the ball, but making the shots from out there can be, can be tough uh, when you're used to, to operating in close. And if he does make a couple of those, then the, the, the climb back is uh, a little harder than, than that. But your point about the guards is exceptionally well taken. Memphis's depth, uh, I thought was amazing uh, that they, I, and you, we talked about the, the parity issue and with a 16 seed that, the guys that come in to try and stop the bleeding when they have to, when other guys get in foul trouble or get tired, it isn't quite there with a 16 boy. It was certainly there with Memphis and it was there with Memphis to the extent of well beyond what we expect from an eight or nine type seed that this was a, this is a national caliber club that, that, uh, that could easily have been a much higher seed for Nemhard and Rasir Bolton to deal with that kind of pressure. Uh, that kind of athleticism uh, without flinching at all, um, not just settling for threes, taking them when they in rhythm uh, in appropriate times, but taking the ball to the hoop uh, when they had to and dealing with uh, guarding them on the other end. Um, there's no question that, that their contributions were, you know, every bit as, as crucial as, as Drew Timmy's uh, power moves inside. Um <clears throat> You know, I would I would say that that uh, we all can. I mean, I know the the Zags themselves have kind of rallied around uh, Andrew Nemhard not getting enough credit, not getting enough attention here. Drew, especially, yeah. and Rasier to that list yeah, too has has been has been their uh, especially has been uh, their PR agent. But in this case, it's absolutely true. There's no if there's anyone more overlooked than Andrew, it's Rasier Bolton. I mean, he just plays quietly and he's one of those guys when you you look at the stat sheet afterwards to the, you look and wait wait he had 17 i didn't see 17 out there but they were very very crucial 17 points and and again all the things that he just does right making the extra pass or um you know just small things that, that just don't show up in a box score um the, it was really crucial for for them to play as well as they did as well as drew timmy there was some real physicality, toughness in that game was required. The Zags didn't show a lot of it in the first half, or at least that uh, didn't match Memphis's first half toughness. Uh, turn that around in the second half. Uh, kind of make this multiple choice for you guys. You can take whichever angles you'd like. Uh, we had the free throw woes for two games for the Zags. Really missed a lot of throws. Uh, you can talk about their toughness. Uh, you can pick that out. You can talk about Timmy's second halves. Uh, you can talk about the guards, whatever topic you'd like to pull away from uh, that weekend. Uh, what are you going with, Richard? Well, um, I'll go with the toughness piece. You know, I think there's a lot made of this idea that, you know, Gonzaga's got to get tough. You, know, you don't keep winning these amount of games if you don't have a level of toughness. I think really the question is, physically, does Gonzaga have the toughness to compete with the Memphis? I mean, quite frankly, Memphis, there's some shades of Baylor last year in that, in, in, on that front line. That was a big front line. I mean, sure, they, you know, they could all jump and run, but the, what, what makes that a challenging front line for a guy like Holmgren in particular, but even Timmy to some degree, is that strength with Duran in particular uh, and their backup big coming in. And that was something against, you know, Baylor that we just could not, you know, couldn't do anything about. You know, I was really impressed with, you know, Memphis kind of hit him in the mouth up front 
to start the game. I mean, you just saw how big they were, and they were they were the ones initiating a lot of contact around the basket. And quite frankly, if you watch this, you know, John and I got the chance to do all weekend. I mean, I watched a ton of basketball, and it felt half the time I wasn't really watching basketball. <laughs> I mean, there's a, it's so physical, and that's a, we could have a whole other podcast about the officiating in college basketball, but. You know, I, they adjusted. You know, I, I credit Holmgren in particular because, you know, in, in, a, in a lot of ways, he's just outgunned physically. You know, he's got no business trying to bang against a guy like Durian, but, you know, he doesn't back down. He may get over, you know, overwhelmed at times, but he, the next play, he's in there throwing his body, trying, you know, trying to stand these guys up, and he doesn't get discouraged. Mm-hmm. You know, I think despite his frame, he's an ultra tough kid. He's competitive, and, he, and he's going to keep playing despite the fact he might have some disadvantages when it comes to strength. So, you know, I, I, I think there's been – for those folks who are talking about that as a potential deficiency for this group, I, I think that's being overdone a little bit. I think this team has shown plenty of, of mental toughness, and I thought they showed plenty of physical toughness against Memphis. Yeah, that second half, they were clearly – uh, had the upper hand in both those areas. And, and Chet Holmgren didn't get a ton of credit either in that game. Had the pl- highest plus minus, yeah. uh, plus 18 by a long shot on Gonzaga's roster. Now, some of that's because Nemhard never left the floor. So he's plus four no matter what <laughs> the, the stats say. But uh, Chet blocked shots. He got rebounds. He, he didn't score it as well as, as maybe – uh, he had hoped, but uh, definitely an influence on the defensive end. Uh, you know, that was, uh, that was a really entertaining 20 minutes of basketball and a high, high level game. Uh, John, uh, it kind of offered the topics there, the multiple choice, A, B, C, D with free throws, with toughness, with the guards, with Timmy, you can go E if you'd like uh, on your own, whatever you'd like. But uh, what do you, uh, what do you see against Memphis? Well, in, in regards to the toughness issue, you know, and Richard's point is, is well taken. You don't win this many games without without having some level of that. But every year in this tournament, there's the toughness game, I think. It, seem, it seems to happen every year. I remember back in 2017, it was the West Virginia game. The same type of ultra-physical uh, grinder game. But, I mean, West Virginia just beat the hell out of them. And, you know, and, and the Zags, you know, survived. Um, you know, I think in maybe 2019, it was what the Florida state game. And I know that was kind of a revenge game for Gonzaga having lost the year before, but it was the same type of deal. A, a team that was very deep that plays 10 guys, uh, all of them physical specimens and, and, uh, and just, a uh, just a tough, tough game and, and Gonzaga handled it. Now, heck, you can even say the UCLA game a year, a year ago in the, in the final four. I mean, that game was required a ton of mental toughness maybe ucla is is not the physical um uh, pounding team that that we mentioned in like west virginia or, or florida state but there's a level of mental time i mean they kept throwing salvo after salvo after salvo at gonzaga and gonzaga wouldn't will does it carry over to the next game well not always obviously baylor got the the best of gonzaga in the championship game and and you know all the gonzaga teams have, have eventually found their their Waterloo eventually in time, but as far as proving that they're tough, yeah, they can, you know, they can withstand these, these close punishing games and, and have, have for a long time. And I think that's the misnomer, you know, that's part of the, the reputation, the bad rap they get from having to play in the WCC schedule at the end. People have, don't have the respect for the, for the league, and it doesn't generally have the same level of athleticism that you'll find in the SEC or or uh, uh, or even in a t- you know, conference like uh, that Memphis plays in the American. So uh, if you're looking at a mid-major league, uh, I don't know. I just think uh, the toughness thing is, is overblown uh, a little bit. Um, and that uh, um, that there's some some issues that, that go beyond that. I think moving forward, um, there's a couple of things that are going to have to happen for Gonzaga. They got to get Julian Strother on track. Um, you know, I think he's 0 for 9 for 3 in, in the tournament so far um, and was really kind of an you know, invisible man in the, in the opener against Georgia State. You know, I don't know what you get. You know, <laughs> you know, that's a matter of getting the guy a couple of shots early that, that he can knock down. 
uh, maybe get his confidence a little bit. But, you know, if he even if he's not playing or even if he's not shooting that well, he has to maybe be a little more involved in other ways, whatever he can do to help. But they've got to get him untracked a little bit. And they need the steady presence that that uh, uh, Anton Watson showed in the in the Georgia State game, where he was sensational. Um, they kind of needed that a little more against Memphis, and and uh, maybe a little earlier than they saw it. So, um, you know, you've got to there's the level of consistency that you have to bring in this tournament. You you can't afford off nights, and and really they can't afford them from anybody at this point. Well, it's on to San Francisco for the top four seeds in the West, all advancing. I believe it's the only region where chalk held up, at least seedings held up. Number one, Gonzaga versus number four, Arkansas. And if uh, uh, Saturday's game was was pretty much a 40-minute audition for what you might see in this one. Uh, Arkansas, very athletic team as well, deep, uh, great length, maybe not the size that Memphis had. Uh, I mean, the uh, Jalen Duran in the middle, it, it, uh, 6'11", 250, hey, what is he, 18, <laughs> maybe 19 years old. Uh, he, Dwight Howard has nothing on that man, on this kid's body. I mean, he is NBA ready. You can just see it. And when the post moves come, he's, he is uh, going to be sensational. Uh, the other matchup is Duke versus Texas Tech, uh, two versus three. Zags have seen both teams, uh, lost to Duke, beat Texas Tech. Uh, let's, uh, let's get first, uh, Duke, Texas tech. That is very interesting. Duke wants to score in the eighties. Texas tech would like to see it in the fifties, Texas tech playing much better than they did against Gonzaga in, in December at Terrence Shannon back a deep team, talented team that thrives on defense. Duke, uh, can really explode offensively. They got Michigan state in those last two or three minutes when it was starting to look like Coach K's last game, I really pulled it together offensively. Uh, John, what do you make of uh, uh, the Blue Devils, the Red Raiders? Uh, I, 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 I still marvel at Texas Tech's roster. They've got, what, the two six eight guys, and then everybody else on the roster is 6'6", 215. I mean, whether it's a forward or a guard. And, and I, I don't know how anybody scores against them. I don't know how Gonzaga scored 69 against them the first time around. They are relentless. Um, and, and that's going to be a, a huge, huge challenge for Duke, even with Duke's, Duke's got great balance. And I think they got, what, five guys in double figures. And then the, the Roach kid, who was kind of an unsung hero um, uh, yesterday, uh, was is, uh, is, da is darn near a, a 10 point a game guy. So, um, you know, it's going to be a great, a great test for Duke. Uh, I know there's a lot of um, sentiment nationally about the Coach K Swan Song tournament here, and I, I hope that and I'm a great Duke conspiracy theorist myself. That that uh, yes, the whistle goes in in the Duke's direction more often than not. I hope Texas Tech isn't isn't a victim of that because they do play a very physical style. Um, they do pinch and squeeze and, and if, if Duke wants to, you know, Duke has the outside shooting, they've got, uh, um, a couple of, of, of real knockdown guys in, uh, uh, Griffin and Moore, And, uh, so they can, you know, they can maybe stretch Texas tech out a little bit if they're hitting, but if they're not, it's going to be a long afternoon for them. I think it's going to be a long afternoon anyway, because Texas tech makes every game a long afternoon. Yeah, there was one play there. T Texas Tech kind of put it together late to beat Notre Dame. They, they were in trouble as well and, and got it done at the end. And uh, I think they scored know, 20 seconds, 15 seconds left. Their guys, they were celebrating, but they ran back down and they guarded that last possession. It didn't mean anything like their lives depended on it. And they just have that drilled into them that that, uh, that, that is an anchor for that team something they can rely on. Uh, the game uh, everyone up here wants to talk about is Gonzaga, Arkansas, Richard. And this is going to be another interesting test. Arkansas has, has struggled to score it, frankly. I mean, 53 points. I think I read somewhere that the, that's the lowest score by an SEC team to win an NCAA tournament game. Uh, the other end of that is they held New Mexico State to 48. Uh, this is a, a, a great defense. 
and and an offense that if it finds itself really could make Thursday's matchup interesting. What uh, what are you looking forward to see Gonzaga Arkansas? Yeah, well, Arkansas is going to their identity is defensively uh, one of the best defensive teams in the country. Um, you know, they shot twenty seven percent over the weekend from three. That's just under what they shot on the year, which I think was thirty um, from three. You know, they're not quite the same, uh, you know, quote-unquote balance as Texas Tech with size, but just a very perimeter forward-dominated team other than Jalen Williams inside. They don't have anybody that you really would look at and say there's a you know, five-man. So they don't have a lot of size up front, but what they do do is they swarm. They're really active, and they play ultra hard. And, and when you look at what they did in the SEC – they're not going to be afraid, which, you know, you wouldn't expect anyway, but, you know, they'd be what LSU, Kentucky, Auburn, um, the who's who of the SEC, they beat them. Tennessee at one point. Um, so this is a top 10 team. I mean, this is what you're going to play as you get further in the tournament is they're playing a top 20 team to try to advance to play a top five team. Um, just kind of how it works. So, um, you know, I, I would think this is, a game where Holmgren should be more comfortable than he was against Memphis. They don't have the size to really just beat him up. Um, and he's not played uh, as well offensively as we saw towards the end of the regular season. At WC City it's, what, it was the old nine from the three point line in, uh, in conference play, or rather in the, in the tournament over the weekend. Um, I'd expect him to be better offensively and then just more disruptive than he was already this last weekend. So I, I'd expect Chet to have a nice uh, sweet 16 game. And if at some point someone's going to say, we can't let Drew Timmy just go to work and, and go get almost 30. So is this going to be, you know, do, do the Razorbacks look to maybe get the ball out of his hands, really be deliberate about doubling them. And can a guy like to John's point, Strother get going from three, um, it's going to be fascinating, but I, I actually don't mind the matchup for GU as good as the Razorbacks are. I, I think this is well, on paper anyway, it, this is a good matchup. And so often these games come down to that in the tournament. I think Gonzaga is a bad matchup for, for, uh, for Arkansas. Well, let's, uh, let's hit one final topic before we, we call it a morning here. It's uh, two day, two games in uh, kind of different uh, uh, performances by Gonzaga in both. They take care of Georgia state. 9372 uh outlast memphis 8278 um is, is gu living dangerously or or is this just how it's going to be in tournaments i mean th this is what we see year after year a lot of times did the opening weekend uh, make you feel more optimistic or less optimistic about the zags chances going forward uh, richard we'll we'll go to you first i feel fine uh, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I feel thought good. Feeling stretched I feel, out. I, I feel good. Yeah, I got up really early this morning and, uh, you know, got a little workout in, just getting ready for the podcast. No, um, you know, I, I think John hit it on the head earlier when he said every, every tournament, if you make a deep run, you've got that toughness game. And I think for Gonzaga to have that in the opening weekend, not that they're not going to play another team like Memphis with that kind of size and all that, all that stuff. But to have seen it this early in the tournament and, and survived it has to give this group a ton of confidence. Um, and they just have a person, you know, when you look at who they have in particular, you know, in their upperclassmen with Nemhard, Timmy, and I think you've got to add Bolt into that mix. You've got three guys who are not afraid. Who, and you know, you know they're going to play well this weekend. They just are. They, they, they're consistent. And they're and they're they're wanting to, they want that moment. Now, does Strother have a better weekend? Does Holmgren get going off that simply? I, mean, I just don't do that. We'll see. But when you've got those three guys and you've gotten through that quote unquote tough game in the second round, I got a ton of confidence that they're going to have a good. I expect them to win Thursday. I know anything can happen. And then everyone talks about getting getting to the Final Four. I've always maintained about so getting getting to the to the Elite Eight getting 40 minutes away from, you know, to the final four. Can you get to that game and hope that you play well and give yourself a chance to win it? And then you're there in that final four weekend. So, um, yeah, I feel good. I, I think it's going to be a good Thursday night. Yeah. And the way they won that game too. You're right. I mean, Drew Timmy 
Drew Timmy has a lot of fun on the basketball floor, off the basketball floor. But man, when he was barking at those guys before the start of the second half, he was in Holmgren's ear. And it wasn't, hey, hey, come on, young guy, let's go. It was <laughs> in his ear. Let's go now. And right. for him to take it over, uh, you got to have your stars. I, it, it's the same thing in the NBA. That when, when the game's on, those guys have to come through. And then to win it with free throws, and them hard and Bolton looking like they were just at practice on a Monday morning, just firing them in, boom, boom, boom. Uh, I think that helps. To win a close game helps. Uh, and, a, and a challenge like they faced, uh, I'll give them some pretty good momentum going forward. Uh, John, you, you feeling good? You feeling a little worried? What uh, What's on your mind? Yeah, I don't think I feel any different about Gonzaga than I did going in. I think this, look, this is the way it's going to be. Um, I think I said last week, you know, Gonzaga's relative ease through the first four rounds last year was a product of the field. Baylor and Gonzaga had separation from the other teams in the tournament. It was just that clear uh, that that separation isn't there among the, in the, say the top three lines this year and, and not even just the top three lines, but below that teams are older guys came back for their COVID year. Um, coaches are figuring out the portal and building with transfers. Jeez, you look at, you look at Arkansas. They, I think they got five guys in their rotation that are from others originally played and, and developed themselves at other schools. You know, I kind of rolled my eyes with all the saying, oh, Georgia State's not a number 16 seed. Then I saw them, and they're not. They're, the, the, uh, say, a, a typical year, they're not a six, they're not a 16 seed. And Memphis was the biggest camouflage team in the tournament. They were a talented mess through December. And then they got it figured out, and then they were just talented. And they were close to a 3, 4, 5 uh, level team than, than, um, than they were an, an 8 or a 9. So, it's the kind of thing that you're just going to have to go through and you're just going to have to live with. The, the important thing is figuring it out. How, you know, when you need to, you go to your strength. You rely on your leaders who happen to be your best players in this case, in Bolton, them hard and Timmy. Uh, it's weird to not include Chet Holmgren in that being, you know, that he's going to be a top one or two pick in the draft, but let's face it. He's still a freshman. He's in a tough position uh, he's, he's going to get ganged up on in, in a tournament like this by uh, big physical guys that he probably hasn't faced all year. But you're going to rely on those seniors. You're going to rely on your leaders. And like Richard said, yeah, you fully expect those three guys especially to play well uh, come Thursday and, and, and uh, possibly beyond. Um, and you just hope that you get the kind of contribution from Chet, from Julian that you've gotten all year. Maybe a little boost off the bench. That never hurts. Something tells me Chet Holmgren's going to have a big say in the, the rest of this tournament. you too think. Good not, too good not to. Yeah. Uh, and I think same with Julian. I mean, Julian had big games and big moments, too, at the WCC yep. tournament. Uh, lit up Duke pretty good. I think he had 20 in that game. Uh, I think their times are, are coming and, and maybe better hurry and get here fast because uh, – Games are arriving Thursday. This is going to be uh, an interesting week in San Francisco. Gonzaga, Arkansas, Texas Tech, Duke. One of those four teams is going on to the final four. Well, that's going to do it for the Zags Basketball Insiders podcast, our latest edition. Uh, our thanks to Jesse Tinsley, master engineer, photographer for us. You can catch this podcast on all the outlets you can find podcasts. You know what they are out there. And it'll also be on the Spokesman uh, website here in, a, in about an hour or two. So thanks for joining us. Uh, hope to visit with you next Monday as well. Thanks again. <laughs>